Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Actor Jennifer Garner stars in the TV adaptation of author Laura Dave's best-selling book, The Last Thing He Told Me. Garner wanted the role so badly, she wrote producers a letter that made its way to Dave. Jonathan Vigliotti sat down with them. What did you say in that letter? I think that I said I I'm, haven't done this. I haven't felt so drawn to a role um, that I needed to let you know why you need to cast me and why I'm right for this job. Laura, do you remember receiving that letter? Yes, the letter wasn't to me, but um, it was shared with me. And so when Jim was just like, oh, well, I think I said this, I'm like, I can tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the best letters I ever got to read. Later in the show, how the pair collaborated during backyard rehearsals. Laura, was there a moment when you realized Jen was your Hannah? Every moment. <laughs> I mean, honestly, but you, you are, know. You're so <laughs> <tasty>. <laughs> yeah. but, that was very diplomatic. But, I mean, honestly, I mean that, but you know, the moment that I really first realized it was really early on. We were in one of our backyard sessions with each other, and you know, we would talk thematically about all these ideas. Can we know the people we love? And something that Jen said in that moment um, made me realize that the answer to that question is we can know the people we love as well as we know ourselves. Then Connor Knighton explores why New England's remaining general stores aren't about commerce, but connection. What's going on? Oh, not too much. That you sense of community is alive and well at the Jenny. Thank you, you have a good day. They sell staples and sandwiches, but people are coming up for more than just convenience. Thank you very much. Like maybe somebody doesn't really need something from the store, but they're like, I'm just gonna pop in and like get a thing. But it's not about the thing, it's about That's the people the and the connection and sense of place and community. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. The TV series, The Last Thing He Told Me, poses the question, just how well can we know the people we love? Our Jonathan Vigliotti looks for answers in conversation with star Jennifer Garner and the author of the best-selling book of the same name, Laura Dave. Sausalito, California is a Bay Area bohemia, best known for its views of San Francisco and maze of floating homes. There are about 400 floating homes here and in Marin County, and they are both incredibly private, and yet you have this wonderful community of people. For author Laura Dave, it was also the perfect setting for a mystery. That dichotomy was something I really wanted to be the backdrop to someone who is both searching for community and also someone who needs to hide. These docks serve as the opening location for her novel, The Last Thing He Told Me, published by Simon & Schuster, our sister Paramount Global Company. It was one of the best-selling books of 2021, and now it's also an Apple TV Plus series starring Jennifer Garner that began streaming Friday. Remember how I lost my parking ticket on our second date? That was me. Sure, but it was my fault. That I lost my parking ticket? I distracted you. Oh. Well, that's true. The thriller follows Garner's character, Hannah, after her husband, played by Nikolai Coster Waldo, vanishes, leaving her and her stepdaughter to piece together the mystery themselves. Tell me who sent you. Go now. All while wondering how well they actually know the man they love. Your husband is not who you think he is. That million dollar idea first came to Laura Dave 20 years ago following Enron's financial scandal and 2001 collapse. What I was most interested in was I saw Kenneth Lay, the CEO's wife, give an interview in which she said, my husband's done nothing wrong. And I was fascinated by the idea of a woman who found herself in the situation where the world was telling her her husband was someone and she believed him to be someone else. And that sort of ruminated for a really long time. It would be another decade before Dave spun that idea into publishing gold. But patience and perseverance seem to have always been her virtues, ever since she began working on her very first novel in her 20s. I was in a coffee shop working on finishing my novel, and I spilled water on my computer, and I lost the entire thing. 
And I remember distinctly lying on the floor of my childhood bedroom and um, my father saying, well, what, what are you gonna do now? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and I said, well, I'm gonna start again. That's the moment I became to myself convinced that I was going to write and was gonna spend my life writing one way or another because no other option felt possible. The finished product, London is the best city in America, became a New York Times bestseller, launching her career. Dave has published five books since. Her latest, The Last Thing He Told Me, is her most read yet, catching the attention of Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine Media Company, along with A-listers like Jennifer Garner, who even wrote a letter to producers asking to play the title role. What did you say in that letter? I think that I said I... I haven't done this. I haven't felt so drawn to a role um, that I needed to let you know why you need to cast me and why I'm right for this job. Laura, do you remember receiving that letter? Yes, the letter wasn't to me, but um, it was shared with me. And so when Jim was just like, oh, well, I think I said this, I'm like, I can tell you everything. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the best letters I ever got to read. The power of a letter. A few letters, yeah. <laughs> Garner says she fell in love with the role while reading the book to her children, whom she co-parents with her ex-husband, actor and filmmaker Ben Affleck. We just devoured it. There's no other way to say it. We, we could not. Bedtime went out the window. We stayed up so late every night. Sometimes it was me saying, I'm so sorry, we have to keep going. It's a cliffhanger. We, I have to see what happens. I'm sorry, I know you have school tomorrow. You're going to be tired. That kind of review is music to Dave's ear. In fact, she says music, the song If I Should Fall Behind by Bruce Springsteen, plays a very real role in her writing. Well, I will wait for you And if I fall behind, wait for me How many times did you say you've listened to this song? I, I mean, I, I, on one computer, it had 13,000. Know, one of the best compliments I get is when readers reach out and say, I couldn't put this down. And I think listening to the same song, for me, I think puts a rhythm to the writing. It helps me move it in a certain way, move the book in a certain way, so that there's almost a musical undertone. A musical undertone oh, that she says sets the tempo for her exploration of the book's central theme. I always start with a question. And for this novel, the question was, can you know the people you love the most? And what does it mean to love the people you love the most? So what I have learned is it's a constant knowing. It's a constant movement into knowing. And one of the gifts you can give people over a lifetime, the people you love, is to know and re-know them as they change and evolve. And why was it important for you to send that message through your writing? Let me say first that I think it is possible to know the people that we love if we accept that the details about them might change. You can sort of know someone on a soul level, and when you're lucky enough to know someone on a soul level, that can be everything. Jen, I ask you that question. Can we ever know the people we love most? What's your takeaway? I, I think um, yes and no. <laughs> We may not know the details that we think we know, but yes, we can know the kernel of who they are. Although my parents, I think about them, they're, they're pretty close. But <laughs> 58 years, that would, that would start to get there, yes. So your parents know everything about each other. My parents might know everything, but um, I don't know. Can you know everything about the person you love? Gosh. It's a yes and no, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With that original question from the last thing he told me still lingering, Laura Dave is already working on a sequel and says there's no doubt who she has in mind for that next chapter. Laura said when she was writing the role of Hannah, she didn't actually picture what Hannah looked like. And now she can't imagine Hannah without your face att attached <laughs> to that goodness. body. <laughs> I could not be more grateful. I mean, the, this, this goes both ways. This is a, a meeting of the minds that doesn't end here. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Jennifer Garner and Laura Dave's chat. You can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. As promised, here's more from Jonathan Vigliotti's chat with Jennifer Garner and Laura Dave.
And what was it like collaborating with her? It was awesome. One of my favorite parts of the process was that shortly before we started filming, um, in our backyard, we have a little fireplace and we would um, sit with the cast, particularly with Jen, and go through the scripts again and again and again. Um, and it was just this incredibly collaborative process in which all of us together really found our way into these characters um, in, in, the, in a deeper way than I could have imagined. And so it was this beautiful mm. experience when we were finally on set that everyone felt such a part of, of, this, of this world that we were putting out there. Salsalito, a very interesting setting for this thriller and love story to take place. What was that like working in that location? How did that kind of inspire the trajectory of the story? Salsalito informed the story and informed the relationships inside of the story because I actually spent a lot of time in San Francisco and I'd been through Salsalito, but I hadn't been out to the floating homes. And I I flew up and went to the community to sit on the dock and experience being there and what it, what it felt like, what it smelled like, what it meant. And what I was really aware of is the isolation mm. of being on the edge of the country, literally on the edge of a dock, on the edge of the country. And that you have to walk all the way in from the dock to get to your car. And if you have groceries, you've got to get them all the way. If you have a child, you know, when we were out there, we saw people going by on skateboards with a kid here and a kid on their shoulders <laughs> and because it's just a long trek. And um, just to put yourself there, what does that mean? And while Hannah had had spent time living, you know, in the hustle and bustle of New York City, it also made sense to me that Sausalito would appeal to her. She's quiet. Mm. She wants to sit and be reserved and be inside herself and and watch. And that is a great vantage point, whether you're even if you're just watching the seals come by. It sounds like this was a very collaborative process. I'm specifically thinking of the backyard story, the sessions of reading together. Do you remember those and, and how that went? It was the greatest joy of the production was the preparation for the production. And that is because Josh and Laura were so incredibly inviting to me. And, and here she had written the book. That is the definition, mm -hmm. right? There's, it's the backstop. We know what this, what we're aiming toward is to bring Laura's book to life. And yet still with this beautiful adaptation, they were open to me pushing and pulling at it and, and struggling with it and, um, and, and falling in love with it, you know? Um, and we worked together to have these yeah. conversations, some of them tricky, and they would go back and revise with an open heart. And that was incredible because it, it, it deepened my understanding of Hannah, but it also gave us a kind of mm. trust and a common ground that we knew we were all in this together for the right reasons. Laura, was there a moment when you realized Jen was your Hannah? Every moment. <laughs> I mean, honestly, but you, you are, know. You're so <laughs> nice. uh, yeah. but, that was very diplomatic. But, I mean, honestly, I mean that, but you know, the moment that I really first realized it was really early on. We were in one of our backyard sessions with each other, and you know, we would talk thematically about all these ideas. Can we know the people we love? And something that Jen said in that moment um, made me realize that the answer to that question is we can know the people we love as well as we know ourselves. Mm. And Jen is so, um, and what she brought to Hannah is so self-contained and, and self-knowing. I think that is one of the reasons there is so much love in this part and why that we get to see that love story come to fruition, why we're longing for this family. It all starts with what she brings to Hannah. I notice you guys fidgeting with these necklaces that are identical. <laughs> what do they represent? What are they? This is the necklace that I wore as Hannah in the entire series. And usually it's tucked under my shirt, but I had it on in every scene. And um, our costume designer, who's a dear friend of mine, uh, Susie DeSanto, she chose this. And she always finds a way to add to the characters that mm -hmm. I'm playing. It's an internal compass. And the reason it's internal is that it's only the heading the right direction if you look it up if you hold it up and look from your vantage point or if you see it in the mirror. So it's really just reminding you that you know where you are and where you're going. And so of course, Lara got this for me and I had to get her one too. 
I know for Laura, music played a critical mm -hmm. role in the creative process. Mm -hmm. Did it also play a role for you? Any songs, because the soundtrack's pretty incredible, any songs that stand out to you? Yes, all of the last thing you told me needle drops are. <laughs> I have that playlist going all the time. Um, Laura wrote a playlist for Hannah as she was writing or as the book was coming out, and she shared it with me early on, and it became the, the music that I listened to while turning wood or while driving or uh, out for a walk. And um, I, I can't think of specific songs. It, it was more mm. the, the mix of it. I mean, definitely the National. I don't think I was aware of the National before, but they are, they're part and parcel to Hannah for me now. There's a scene in the series, I think it's outside the stadium, where Hannah asks Bailey, to do something, and Bailey responds, I guess I have no choice. And then you as Hannah respond, you always have a choice with me. Yep. Are you that cool as a mother? Because <laughs> that, that's pretty cool. There are a couple of things that define Hannah to me. One of them is that that you always have a choice with me. You, you just, and she says always, all the time. If you say, oh, thank you for that, always. You know, or if you say, can we do this? Of course. She always says always. She always says of course. And I, she means it. You know, she, she, because she's so all out for the people that she loves. She is defined by always and of course. And I have tried to bring that to my parenting. I have tried to bring, of course, always. In real life, I feel like it's harder. In real life, it's all harder. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, as an author, to hear an artist and actor speak so highly of the written word to mm -hmm. inspire what has transpired, what is that like for you? I'm, I'm really proud of myself that I'm not crying. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it has been the great gift of this experience, is getting to watch mm. Jen become Hannah. Up next, when connection yeah. is the selling point. Welcome back. General stores have long been victims of grocery chains and big box stores, but these small regional outposts offer something their outsized competitors don't stock, community. Here's Connor Knighton. This is the big moment. Opening day at the Weiwei store in Saco, Maine. There we go. Is always cause for celebration. We're open. After a long winter, customers pour in it's gonna be sugar daddies. to get their first taste of spring. I wanted to be the first customer of the year for good luck. Yeah, it's a special day. Go ahead, do some more. Today, these visits feel especially go. sweet. Keep going. For a while, everyone thought that this store had closed for good. It was gone. It was sad. It was like an old friend had died. Some of this candy here was two for a penny when I was a kid. Peter Scontris grew up in Saco. The Weiwei store originally operated as a country general store. Back then, it was considered way, way out of town and was run by the same family for nearly a century. When it closed down in 2003, it sat empty for eight years. I'm thinking 895. Until Scontris and his wife, Bridget, okay, both retired teachers, reopened the store as a labor of love. Thank you very much. It was a treasure, and it, it had to be taken away from them to really understand it and appreciate it, to get to the point of a greater appreciation of what this was. It was a real loss for our community. It was a hole. In the community of Albany, Vermont, a 2013 fire forced their general store to close. Sounds great. Resident Kristen Yuri and her neighbors felt the absence immediately, but any new owner hoping to make a profit was scared off by the high renovation costs. Could you have afforded to buy this on your own? Oh, yeah, no. so yeah. we could have bought the property um, and we would not be in the store anymore. Today, Albany store, the Jenny, is yeah. thriving again. Right, we need to add the red stripe. Okay. Run by partners Emily McClure, so, um, Kit yep. Basim, and Jana Smart. The women already owned a successful store in the nearby town of Craftsbury, but in the case of Albany, the community now owns the building. So this is Albany store, mm. and we're operating it. And I think that's yeah. the key to success in this kind of business. The Albany Community Trust raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to purchase and renovate the store, utilizing everything from grant applications to pie auctions. This is a place that says that this is a town, right? That like there's a there there. Ben Doyle is the president of the Preservation Trust of Vermont. 
The group has been helping towns take charge of their local stores to ensure they survive. We want to be able to go to a store where the people running it know who we are, they know what we like, and they offer something that we can buy. And that sense of community that you can't buy. What's going on? Oh, not too much. That sense of community is alive and well at the Jenny. Thank you. You have a good day. They sell staples and sandwiches, but people are coming for more than just convenience. Thank you very much. Like, maybe somebody doesn't really need something from the store, but they're like, I'm just going to pop in and, like, get a thing. But it's not about the thing. It's about the people and the connection and sense of place and community. The general story of rural general stores is not necessarily a happy one. In this area, saltwater taffy is big. Unless you've got someone doing it purely for the love of it, it's a hard road for young entrepreneurs. You get a barbecue too, please. Which is why the locally supported model may offer a path forward. A community deciding there's a value to having a store that goes beyond the bottom line. That's what we're trying to keep, right, is hold on to these main streets, hold on to these places that actually do bring people together. That it's not a, another Dollar General, that it's not a big box store, that it's actually, there's a heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. That's Have the first tip of the year. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.